if you'll turn to your place in Daniel 1, I, I want to talk about Daniel. Um, he's going to become um, an exile prophet. He didn't go there as a prophet. He went there as a, a teeny bopper, I guess. Most historians believe that he was somewhere between the t age of 10 and 17 when he was taken captive on the first deportation where they took all the aristocrats and nobility, all the children, um, which was typical for uh, Babylon. They incorporated, they took him and trained him and, and brought him into their culture and uh, And we know some things about him. He was from the tribe of Judah, and, and more than likely, his aristocratic standing was from the house of David, from the lineage of David. And yet God, God sent him in to be a prophet, put him into exile. The Babylonians trained him. They had an excellent educational program. They trained him. I mean... Daniel's become, going to become known as ten times wiser and the wisest man of Babylon. And they, were, they ate up by the time they got to, <clears throat> got to uh, you know, they stopped at, they had, conquered, they had conquered Egypt and was just headed back home. They thought they'd stop by, <laughs> stop by and see if they could get some more riches because one of the kings of Israel had, you remember, had boasted about all the wealth they had in the temple. So he just wanted to stop by and see if it was true. It was true, so he took it all. <laughs> and with it, a whole bunch of people. <laughs> but it was kind of like dropping, you know, stopping. I was coming back from Gulf Shores and Priestlers. Um, but Montgomery's there. So... One day, Jane said, let's stop and do it. So we stopped one day 100 years ago. Now we have to stop every time we go by. Well, that kind of reminds me of him. He's going by, and he says, oh, look, there's Priestlers. Let's stop by and see what they got. And uh, the rest, you know, the rest is terrible history for those people. <clears throat> but anyhow, here we are in Daniel. And we're in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. He is the king of Judah, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. Actually, if you, if you know anything about history, he's coming back from Egypt, and he stops by and beseeches it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along some of the vessels of the house of God, and then he brought them to the land of Sinai, uh, to the house of, of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure of his God in that temple. Then the king ordered Aspenthaz, the chief of his official, and this is a very important guy in the life of David. Um, this guy was the director of, of all the training of the youth that was ever captured and to acclimate them into the Babylonian culture as Penaz, uh, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, and Daniel was of the noble family, royal family. Now, there's a key word in here, and we'll see it later, but it's the word youths. It's yelad. It's Y-E-L-E-D, yelad. Um, and you're going to find it a lot in chapter 1. The youth in whom was no defect. So they, they screened these. They took, they took all of them, and then they screened them. They went, went through a process of screening, kind of like colleges do. You know, anybody can apply, but only a few can get in kind of business, right? They have a, uh, and they had an aptitude test and all that kind of stuff. They, they, they were very... Uh, sophisticated in selecting kids that they thought could go through their training program, which would be like, um, oh, I suppose, the old idea of an Ivy League high education, uh, who were good looking, showing intelligence. They had an aptitude test. Every branch of wisdom endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, 
and who had ability for serving in the king's court. That's what they were looking for. So they went through a screening process. Those who passed that screening process, they went through an intense university training program. And he ordered, uh, he ordered him, that's Nebuchadnezzar, the king ordered him, this, this is the man who is the official over that responsibility, uh, Ashpenaz, uh, to teach them literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Listen, the, one of the interesting things about Daniel, he's going to serve four different kings, and he's going to have to learn uh, something like five languages. And he, he mastered them. I mean, he could speak them fluently. Uh, he was quite a guy. And the Bible tells you how he got that. He, he wasn't, it was as, and I got to tell you this, this is so important to your life. It wasn't because he was, a, I mean, he had, he had a good package to work with, okay? He went through the screening process and he had, I mean, he had good quality and integrity. He was already come out of some learning. He had a fair IQ. He wasn't a genius. The Bible makes it clear God is what made him a genius. God made him one. Is the inner man, not the outer man. And it, what I love about the story of Daniel is the Babylonians, they knew how to train the outer man, but they couldn't train the inner man. Daniel, Daniel, uh, Daniel went already trained by God in the inner man. And he was a hit right off the start. I mean, just a, a little kid. You know, I don't, they, they, it was about a, a three-year training program crammed in uh, to these kids. But anyhow, the king appointed for them a daily ration. You know, this is a famous story of the daily ration. Uh, from the king's choice food and from the wines which he drank and uh, pointed that they should be educated three years. I mean, that's really intense university-type training. They had to be trained in the sciences and the languages. And I mean, it's what we would call high, high-end uh, education, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. And then we meet the four guys that are famous in the book of Daniel, right? And, and we see them with their, with their Hebrew names in this passage, and then later we're going to see them given, and they're probably Daniel keeps his name, but yet the three other guys, everybody calls them by their Babylonian names, that, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, but these are their Hebrew names, and one day we'll come back and we'll, we'll dis discuss all, the, all these importance of names. Then the commander of the officials signed them new names, and that's in verse 7, Okay. That's where we're going tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence, uh, classroom etiquette to confess sin if necessary. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. If you believe that for your salvation and that you have a need for that for your salvation, then you're a believer. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the church age, and the Holy Spirit's there to teach you the truth. You can't study it in carnality. You can't study it, study it in your flesh. Whether you're an unbeliever or a believer, you can't study it in your flesh. You've got to study it under the power of the Holy Spirit to get any divine wisdom, any truth. And so the secret to that, how do I know if I'm carnal or spiritual? Well, if you're carnal, you've got personal sin. you got personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sin, the tongue of vert sins. If you're aware of it, then you confess it. First John 1, 9 says, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and sanctify you or, or to cleanse you. And that allows you not to be saved. That allows you to be sanctified. That puts you back under the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit who will teach you tonight. And so I give you classroom etiquette to take that. It, you are a priest in the church age. Every believer is a priest, according to 1 Peter 2. It's a priestly responsibility to take responsibility for your own spiritual momentum in life, both in learning and living the Word of God. Father, we're so thankful uh, for these that have come our way today, both by automobile and by Internet. We enter a new study on uh, Daniel's prophecy, but we look at Daniel the captive first. And we pray, Father, tonight that you would show us great things from your Word, how to have poise over peril, 
uh, how, how, how important is the inner man's spiritual growth than the outer man's success? It's the inner man's success that has influence in the world for God. And I pray we would see those things tonight in the life of Daniel as a young person. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, notice on your, we'll, next week we'll get into the 70 weeks of Daniel, one of his great prophecies. But today, I want to, I want to take a look at Daniel, the, the captive, um, who will become a prophet. Uh, his name is interesting. I wrote it on your paper. On the very end of that name is this word E-L. Uh, right? And that is the word for God. And this word where you get Dan, uh, I wrote it down there so you'll see it. That's a D-A-N-I on your paper. Uh, that is the word for judge or judgment. J judge or judgment is the word din, D-I-N. Uh, that's the, the vocabulary word. Um, therefore, his name literally, when you look it up in the English, they'll tell you that his name means God is my judge. Actually, his name in Hebrew means uh, my judge is God. Because, see, Daniel, the, the judgment, God, okay, the judgment is first. But either way, it's just so you understand it. God is my judge or my judge is God. See, his name means it takes this, this word becomes very personal. And listen, his name is very prophetic. Now, he didn't name himself. But his name is very prophetic. That's true almost with all names of significance in the Old Testament. Their name gives you a clue to their life uh, in the plan of God. And, and his life is going to be, um, my judge is God. Listen, in the first chapter, you're going to learn that. Nebuchadnezzar is going to say, you know, I want these kids, you know, eat my food and, and become acclimated in our complete culture. You know, grits. I want them, you know, if he was in the South, he'd have to eat some grits and, uh, and listen, he, he, he lives up to his name. He doesn't rebel against them. He simply says to the official over him, why don't you, listen, why don't, you, why, don't, why don't we run a little test for 10 days? Let me eat my vegetables. You serve the rest of them what they want. They got, because Daniel said, I, I, can't, I, I, I can't do that. And he said, well, if you don't, then I'll tell you what will happen. My head will be on the, the block. And Daniel said, well, I don't want that. But listen, let's, let, let's see. Because he said, well, what would be the difference? He said, well, I can't have you go before the king and, and you look bad. I mean, you know, we're, the king is looking for, he's going to put you under a, on, on their diet. And you're going to have a certain look when you go in there. And you got to have it. And I, I don't know if we can get it on vegetables. You know, we're, we're, we're meat people, so I don't know why I can get that look on it. Daniel says, well, let's, let's give, us the, give the four of us a 10-day test. If not, well, we'll submit to your, your, your way. But I believe my God will show that we're better off following his rules, honestly, in regard to food than, than you might imagine. Well, they did. And 10 days later, they shined above everybody else. See, because he had character, he had poise in peril or in difficulty because of the inner man. The inner man shined out. And my, God, my judge is my God. And immediately you see this attitude in him, not a rebellious one. He submits. But he says, look, let's do a little test. If, if you're right and I'm wrong, I, look, I'll eat food. And the guy who says, that's fair enough. And, uh, and that's pretty much the way the life of Daniel operates through the book. That's pretty much the way he operates. Um, 
my judge is my God. It's pretty much the way he operates. So Daniel was taken captive on the first deportation in 605 B.C. Uh, most historians believe he was somewhere between the age of 10. I'll tell you why they think that. One of the reasons is the training school they went through. Most kids that went through that, they were certainly out by 17. They didn't take them if they were older than that. They put them someplace else. But they took these kids that way, and they had a three-year program. They tried to get them. They tried to get them out of there by 14 or so. Now they might make some exceptions with bright kids that came out of out of this type of a situation. They might make some exceptions, but that was pretty much the rule. And listen, Daniel lived all the way to Cyprus, uh, Cyrus, all the way to Cyrus. So he was. Listen, he, he was in his 80s when he died. I mean, he lived through the whole 70 years plus. You know, they were in Babylon 70 years, right? I mean, he, and he went in 605. The, they count, the, the 70 years has started with 586 B.C. when the fifth hit. So that it, it's pretty, so he, you know, he's, so that's how we try to gauge some of his age. According to our lesson uh, text up there, Daniel 1, Daniel was in the category called youth. I wrote it out in the Hebrew so you could see it. But this word is used a lot in chapter 1. It, and, and you may have to, I, do, I don't, my paper had a myth. But it's 1, 4, 10, it's one, chapter 1, verse 4, watch this now, 4, 10, 13, 15, 15. I had, a, I only had a 1 there, 15 and 17. And it's a Y-E-L-E-D. That's the, that is the vocabulary word for this, youth. And youth is a pretty good translation for that. These are not babies. And they're not, they're, they're, they're not in career yet. They're in some kind of training place. Um, and we're in a foreign nation. You know, like if this was here, we would say, well, probably by 12, they're in it. They're, they've been selected to be into something but we're in a foreign nation, <clears throat> okay? Uh, tonight, I'm going to look at five things about Daniel, uh, the captive, um, who became an exile prophet. The point number one, the captivity of these youths, as described in the Bible, was, was the fulfillment of Isaiah. Watch this. Now, you know Isaiah... He was ahead of all of this deportation business. He was ahead of it. He was a prophet to the south kingdom uh, who preached on the fall of Assyria and the coming fall of, of Judah. In the 39th chapter, when you look over there and just flash through it a little bit, um, ver just picking out verses 5 through 9, um, Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah, and his discussing them some things in verse 5. Uh, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that, and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day shall be carried to Babylon. <coughs> Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons who shall issue from you whom you shall beget shall be taken away, and they shall become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. <laughs> and Hezekiah thinks that's a good word. Uh, this is what is now being lived out. That's a prophecy. This is now being lived out in 605 in the life of Daniel and, and at least the four, his four buddies. And there's a large, a large, a large group that were taken in the, four, in the first. If you read second, if you read Second Kings 24 and 25, it talks about these deportations. The large group of people. Um, now here, here's a point for me, at least. Therefore, this is a good thing for Daniel. Uh, this is a good thing for Daniel as well as for Joseph in the plan of God. I mean, sometimes it's hard to see when peril comes in your life or what you might consider that. 
that, that this is a good thing. But listen, it may not be a good thing in what you expected your life to be or turn out. But the inner man, the spiritual person in your life should be able to say to you, all things work together for good. Therefore, this is a good thing in the plan of God. If you want to know why this has come into your life, you're going to have to go to the Bible and reason it out with the Lord. Is that not fair? And listen, every guy in the Bible that you study that did that, his life turned out magnificent in the plan of God. And we read about him and they are our heroes. Daniel, Joseph, Daniel, all these people that, <clears throat> they listen, and they may have not, listen, they may have not made Hebrews 11 because they have books named after them. <laughs> they have books named after them. You read the whole book of his life. <laughs> like Daniel. Mm. Joseph, in, we've studied this so many times, but you know that in Genesis 5th chapter, verse 20, that's how, that was Joseph's attitude, wasn't it, to his brothers? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Now, how is that possible? You have to flip it. Listen, there's the, world's, there's the world's view on your life. Here is the divine view on your life, right? I mean, so often we describe this thing, all things, ha you know, it, it, what happens is good to your life, right, out of Romans 8. But it's good not in what you expect, not what the world expects, but what God expects is where it's good. You have to find out what God calls good. And boy, is, does that not change your perspective of how you handle what's going on in your life when you do that? I mean, it just, it, it, immediately God says, switch off that negative and get into the positive. And once you do, you go like, wow. You know, and once you do that in your life and a real life experience, it gets stuck. I mean, I won't permit myself to have a bad day if it even crosses my path which often it does, right? I mean, we have moments where he does a pfft. You go like, oh, jeez. And you go like, what? You know, pass your life. Listen, everything God has signed off on, nothing passes through your life as a believer in Christ that God hasn't signed off on. If he signs off, it's good. Qu don't you whine one moment with me. And that really changes your perspective. I just don't have bad days anymore. I don't permit it. I want, them, I want to be in a place where all the good things that God has for me can flow to me and through me. You know, I didn't, that's not give me an R, give me an O, give me an N. Come on, Ron. I, I, don't, I don't do that that way. I just believe this. I mean, I just believe it. I've worked my way through difficulty situations, going to the positive, looking for, and listen, I think that's what God wants from all of us. Everybody I see in the Bible that, that has character and integrity, this is what they found. This is not brain surgery. This is the key, in my opinion. At least it has been in my life. In the first deportation, deportation of the youth of the Aristocrat nobility that were taken captive, Daniel was part of it. Daniel 1-3, along with his buddies, his, his four good, the four of them, they were the amigos, weren't they? They were the amigos. Daniel, like Jesus, though, Daniel, like Jesus, was from the tribe of Judah and the lineage of David. You know, you, you read about his lineage in Luke 2 and read about Daniel's. I mean, he came, he, he came from uh, that type of stock. Daniel, like Joseph, served, ser served uh, a foreign government. In a position of authority, when I say the Chaldeans, Joseph didn't serve the Chaldeans, but he served a foreign nation is what I mean. Daniel, like Joseph, who served Egypt, he served the Chaldean government in positions of authority. Just think about that. I mean, it's amazing to me. And listen, they did it as very young people, didn't they? Look, you can go to college and you can work on the outer man. But the real secret to life 
is to work on the inner man. The inner man will take you where the outer man will drop you, will, will throw you out of the car. It's, it's hard to get people in America to understand, people in the church, it's hard to get them to understand. It's hard to get kids to understand that when they go to college. They just think that if they get their degree, yada, yada. Christian kids ought to understand. That, that's a small part of the big picture. It's a small part. Listen, you can train the outer man. Won't carry anywhere. Won't carry anywhere. Get you ahead of somebody, won't carry anywhere. Listen, it takes God to do that. You can have all the education, all the degrees, and all that kind of stuff. It's the inner man. If you've been born again, it's the inner man that's the key. Dan so, look, listen. Daniel was the absolute top authority. He was the chief of the whole religious system. Think about that. Think about that. I mean... He was the Pope, you know, in, our, in ways of people thinking. You know what I mean? I mean, he had that kind of authority. And you know how he got it? God. God interpreted all of his dreams. Daniel, Daniel went to God and said, look, I got to interpret this dream. I don't know what it is. Listen. Listen. The better you know how to do that, the better off you're going to be. Even if you think you know, you should go to God and make sure you're on the right track. You got to check yourself out on it. You can read about that in Daniel 5, 11 through 12. And in Daniel 1, 20, for as every matter of wisdom and understanding about, the we, about which the king consulted them, he found them, that's the four guys, that's the four amigos, he found them ten times better or wiser than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all of his realm. Ten times wiser than the wisest. And listen, he knew how to pick wise people. He was picking them from every nation. He didn't go through a nation. He didn't try to pick up the, the, the top of their people and took them with him. America ought to learn that. That, that ought to be your policy for people coming into your nation. People that can better your nation. This guy was really smart about that. But a lot of them were Alexander the Great and everybody else were. They all learned from each other the importance. Here's the second point. In Daniel 1.4, Daniel 1.4 tells us that Chaldeans had developed a system of aptitudes for selecting certain skills for language and service in the government and the culture of Babylon. Aspinaz, Aspinaz was assigned by King Nebuchadnezzar for the training of these youth as we met. He's a key guy. He's over the whole. He's the president of the university. Apart from the cycling of the word of God, residing in the soul of a believer, this would be considered a method of brainwashing. Would you agree with that? They tried to brainwash these kids, right? And that was their purpose to get them out of their culture and into their culture where they could serve their culture with, a, with what they considered honor. The truth of the matter is a system of brainwashing. It was a, a worldly system. It was cosmos diabolicus in a worldview, but one that they, but you could work over the nature of man. Okay? However, when you study the life of Daniel, <coughs> you will find a youthful, aged believer, very young, young and aged believer, with great spiritual integrity like Job. He's going to be a kid that has this kind of integrity. I mean, when, he, when, when they put him through this food deal, and that's just the beginning, he holds fast to his integrity. He doesn't try to outsmart him. He doesn't try to go around him. He goes to God over him. He goes to God over him. God is over everybody. You don't have to go around. You don't have to go under. You don't have to climb over that somebody to get there. You go to the Father who is over everything. Daniel, that just makes so much sense. And Daniel had that kind of sense as a very young person. 
He goes through a screening process and then three years of training, according to Daniel 1.5. I love Daniel, if we can get back to Daniel for just a moment. Uh, Daniel 1, look at Daniel 1, uh, 17 and 18. Look, look what this says about this kid. He's just a kid. As for these four youth, we know the amigos, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Can you imagine that? This is a very, a very educated um, Babylon. I mean, they they want to they got to train these people and post them in foreign places like Pilate and people like that. Rome did it. All these all these did. The Medes did it. The Persians did it. The Greeks did it. The Romans did it. All all great nations knew they that they had to do that. In every branch of literature and wisdom, Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which the king has specified for presenting them, that's at the end of their training and graduation, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, these kids are knocking it out of the ballpark. And you know how they're doing it? Not because they're super intelligent that their IQs are 500 or something. They're doing it because their God is everything in their life. And God is honoring that. That's a, that, listen, if we learn anything, get that. Wow. Ten times wiser than the wisest. That's who you are. If you love the word of God, that's who you are. Your genius is in God's head, right? He's the genius. Put that genius in your, in your heart. Put it in your head. People, I, just, I can't learn this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I just, somebody said to me, well, you know, I only, I only have a night. I left high school when I was in the ninth grade. I said, what are you talking about? What do I care about that information? Well, I don't know that I could come to the School of Biblical Theology and make it. I said, well, look, are you saved? Let's talk about that first. Stop this foolishness. I'm not looking for people uh, to come to school that have all those kind of worldly credentials. I'm looking for somebody who has a heart for God. If you have a heart for God, you can learn everything God wants you to know. And you'll be ten times wiser than anybody else that has all the credentials. Well, anyhow, listen what the Lord says to Satan. Have you ever considered my servant Job? Listen, this is what God is looking for you and I. I want you to get this now. I want you to get this because this, everybody in this, in this room here tonight, this is what he's looking for in us. Listen, for there is no one like him on the earth. He has one thing that God loves. He has one thing. All the doctrine that he has in his soul, God likes that. But he, he doesn't care about it if you can't apply it. He don't care how much you know if you don't use it. He's interested in the guy who learns to live it, who loves the living of it, who loves the challenges of it. Because that's a guy who has integrity in the angelic conflict. One word. You know how God describes that man or woman? There is no one like him. There is no one. Listen, here's what he says to you and me. At least this is what he's been saying to me. Ron, there is nobody in your generation like you. There is no one on earth like you. Now, there may be, but he's speaking to me. Because you have integrity. I'm not talking about human integrity. I'm talking about divine integrity, where I stay true and honest to God. You know, people always say, yeah, honest to God. Somebody said that to me the other day, and I went, whoa, let's talk about that. Of course, they meant it completely different, didn't they? But I use every opportunity to talk about the Lord. I use every opportunity. They used it, and I went, whoa, let's talk. Okay. 
Let's talk. Honest to God. I'll go with that. Honest to God. Look. He says to Satan, there is no one like him on the earth. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Look at this. And he, he lumps that all up into this word. And he still holds fast to his integrity. That's pretty powerful. And you know, that's, and you know, because we studied Job, that's the key to the whole book of Job in the life of Job. Integrity. It's used over and over. It's used in the second chapter. It's used in the 27th chapter. And it's used in the 31st chapter. This word integrity. This word integrity that's introduced in this conversation with Satan is the word that carries Job all the way to the end of his peril successfully. It's Daniel, listen, Daniel's learned this as a very young age. Listen, not through not going through the fire to learn it. He's learned it in classroom. Now he's in the fire. He went captive. Listen, the fiery furnace was being captive and no telling what how he, how he left there. I mean, in the now he didn't burn it down till 586, but in 605, he put a he put a serious whipping on him that they wouldn't under, they understand if you he put a dummy, uh, you know, a puppet king up. And he said, look, at if you, I'll, I'll come back. I mean, he, he put a serious threat on him and, and not just talk. I mean, he whacked him pretty good. And, and Daniel may have lost his father, mother, brothers, sisters. Who knows in all this mess? He walks out of there. He walks out of there with integrity, with God. Well, this, this, is, this, this is pretty tough for me, Father, but I know you have a plan for my life. I wouldn't be on this march if there wasn't a plan. My father-in-law had that prisoner of war three times. Three times? He went three times? Thank you, Jesus. Three times? Not that dead. God has a plan for me. And listen, he believed he had a plan for him in Germany. Not just in America. He didn't keep me alive to, just to go home. He put me as a missionary in this field. I love that about that old man. He was, he was out, Daniel was so outstanding that he was given the Chaldean name, Belshazzar. That word B-E-L on the front, there shouldn't be, I, don't, I got two L's in there. It's a one L because that's their God. That bell, that means Prince of Bell. That's B-E-L. And B-E-L, actually, I think his name is spelled B-E-L-L-U, was the equivalent to Zeus, if you're familiar with Greeks. Um, and what, and I've mentioned it, but what I, I find, and so they gave him this name and put him in authority over all of that, right? Put him, he was the authority over all of that. Um, I mean, we wouldn't think this is a big deal, but in their culture, that name that they gave him and then gave him the authority to go with it, that's about as big as you get in that, in that, in that uh, discipline in that discipline, I, when I say that, I'm talking about education in, in that type of thing, in that area. That's, a, that's just the highest you can get with a title. The, his name is a title. Um, and for me, it just proves that you can change the outer man and not the inner man. And the inner man is where it all, all occurs. Uh, Daniel, when I read through the book of uh, the colonel's writings on Daniel. Then I went back and reviewed some of them. Um, I th and I, I think uh, it was probably in chapter one. I don't remember. I should have wrote it down, but I think it was in his little book on Daniel, the, what he called chapter one at page 118. He says, through indoctrination, the Chaldeans were attempting to change the Bible-leaving nobility into a pagan aristocrat. See, that's what they're, that, that's what they're they, we call it brainwashing. 
Point three, today's teens also face the test of, of uh, parenting, par parenting problems, peer pressure of high school and college, choices of career and marriages. And listen, we must prepare them with inner, the inner man qualities of spiritual life. And then they can go out there and they can face all these challenges, all these pressures and all these problems. And if you think that you, if you send them out there, if you send them out there and they don't have this kind of training, then they're going to be sheep among wolves. And so, you know, as a church and as parents, as people in your family, um, You know, it's important to help these kids. When our teens are not, not consent, listen to me. When our teenagers, I'm talking about Christian teenagers now. When our teenagers are not consistently cycling categorical Bible doctrine by faith, they, are, they will easily succumb to cosmos diabolicus. It's a, it's a dominant force in the world. This is their system. And they all have a system to it. The, the Chaldeans had a system. Daniel and Joseph are proof that the cycling of bio, categorical Bible doctrine works in the life of teenagers. Agreed? These were both very young. And they got it. And they hung with it. Look, you talk about two guys that were ripped away from their culture, their family, their influences and everything in their life at a very young age. What carried them through? The word of God. The word of God that they had cycled was carrying them. It carried them to a place of safety where they could keep cycling it, where they could have on their breaks the study of the word of God. Keep cycling it. You know, that's the story of 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, isn't it? Listen. Listen. Here's how kids study. Here's how kids study. I'm talking about high school kids. I'm talking about grammar school, and I'm talking about college. They either study every day consistently and learn, or they cram and stay unlearned. Even if they get a degree, they didn't learn nothing. You learn nothing from cramming. I mean, how many times have we crammed, learned nothing? Oh, we got through. We, we got a C. I passed. What do you remember? Nothing. Nothing. Because that's not how you learn. Nothing. <clears throat> nothing. I see, I see churches filled with these kind of Christians. They never consistently do anything daily. They don't walk in the spirit daily. They don't walk by faith daily. They don't cycle, the inhale, exhale of the word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. They don't do it. They wait till test time come, and test time comes. That's why you're a child of God. Test time comes, and what do they do? They cram. And how well do they do? At best, by the skin of their teeth. At best. Are they able to embrace it? Are they able to overpower? Are they able to see God enter into all of that and do great things and then have influence on people that witness that? Nah. Nah. <clears throat> the presence of people tonight in, uh, in our study here is evidence of this. There's always something more important than Bible study if you don't set it up in priority. There's always something more important. Who doesn't have something? I have a lot of things on my docket that I could say were more important. There's always something. This is, it's called the world system. There ought to be, you have to run from the inner man that says there is nothing more important. <clears throat> nothing more important. What is more important than inhale, exhale the Word of God? <clears throat> now, a person could have an accident, a person could have there are a lot of things, but I'm talking about volitional decisions that you go like it is the consistency of this in your life. 
where spiritual growth momentum occurs. It's the consistency. Not this Christianity that just lives the way they want, and then all of a sudden it's test time, they cram, boom, on, and they skid on their nose all the way to first base. All the way to first base. They get to first base, they look like a wreck if they make it. <clears throat> Daniel, Joseph, and others in the scripture are proof that cycling it on a consistent basis, and this is the one thing, listen, I can't, listen, I want you to get this now. It's not on your paper. The only source of divine viewpoint, the only source of divine viewpoint is the word of God. There's no other. I don't care. Whatever you're substituting that with is not working. Not working. And if you belong to a local church, that's where you ought to be. Oh, well, you say, I study my Bible every day. Well, what do you do with, with Hebrews 10.25, forsake not the assembly of yourself together? Yes, you should study your Bible every day. But how about on Tuesday night? How about Wednesday night? Or how about on Sunday morning with us? I mean, what, 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 how significant is the assembly of the family of God in a community. How important is that? It's a huge statement just as much as it is take the Eucharist. I proclaim. I take part in the Eucharist. I proclaim the Lord until he comes. That's what the assembly does. As well as what happens within the internal part of it. The, the gifting and all that. You got to be careful how you, how you choose to do the, to, you got to be careful how you choose to do what God says you ought to, why you choose not to do what he says you ought to do. You've got to really be smart that, don't you? Man. You, because, listen, there's only two ways you can walk. You can walk by faith or sight. You can either walk in the flesh or in the spirit. <laughs> there are not other options. You got to be careful how you, how you do that. I'm just saying you ought to be careful how you do that. These young believers, listen, I find this wonderful. These young, these four, the amigos, these four were not herd bound. I work really hard with my grandkids as I did with my kids, not to, not to, not to permit them to be too much herd bound. If you're going to get herd bound, be sure you're with a thoroughbred herd. So if you're going to get herd bound, let's get herd bound with a bunch of Christians and on fire for God. Right? Not with a bunch of people who are living wild with the world. I'm not opposed to herd bound. Let's be sure that we know that they're running with a herd that's out trying to get people's life changed and have a message for their life. Right? I worked that way with my kids all my life and it was a great struggle. I mean, I had, to make, I had to make a lot of tough decisions with my kids about it and have to set them down and go like, you know, you can't do that. And you can't run with that group of people. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> and I had to listen to all that. And I, well, it don't matter. We're not going to do that. And so, you know, they cheat and go behind my back and do that. And I catch them. Then I, you know, I bring discipline on them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you play that game if you want to. And listen, my kids, listen, God take care of all that. Every time they, I promise you, they would have a wreck. They were not supposed to be with a group of people and the place they were at. And I would get a call from the policeman. And your child has just had an accident down here. I would go, up, oh, I'm saying that. Was. You can cry all you want to, but we're still going to deal with this as, as, as spiritual people. When we get home, we're going to deal with this as spiritual people. <clears throat> so. These were, these were young believers who were not herd bound. Listen, I love this. You know, they stood up. Uh, when, when I'm with my little grandkids, I ask them, I, and I always do this, I, I ask them, what are the in things now? What's the in? What's in now? What's in? What's in in the music? What's in in this? What, 
let me see your cell phone. What do you? What games do you play? Uh, you know, when when yeah, when they hesitate to give me their cell phone, like I know what I'm doing. When they when they hesitate to give me their cell phone, I know there's stuff on that cell phone. Now nah, they blah, 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 grandpa. Blah, blah. I wouldn't know how to find it if I go. But I hand it to one of my older kids, and they can find it in the flash. But I wouldn't know. But they don't know. I don't know. They come to church more often than they would. Um, so this herd bound are into in things. What what is in? Okay. This is how you turn. Daniel shows you how you turn cursing of adversity into divine blessing in your life. Daniel will live through the 70 years of captivity with integrity. He will have an impact. Once again, God is preserving a priest nation. He's preserving a people of God. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes you have no idea the influence upon your, that your life has because all you're doing is just trying to keep the car in the road. <laughs> I mean, you're just trying to keep the car in the road. And everybody else is watching saying, look, at he's a marvelous driver on the ice in this storm. And look at him. He just keeps the car in the road. And you go like, whoa, that was just what I was doing. I didn't know that anybody, I didn't even pay any attention to anybody was out there. I was trying to keep the car in the road. The influence, and you see it in jo Joseph's life, preserving. The picture is so much bigger than what the road you're driving, the car you're in. It's so much bigger because it's the plan of God. When you participate in the word of God, actively engaged in your life, you're dealing with the bigger picture of the plan of God, and it affects your generation. You see it in Daniel, you see it in Joseph, you see it in all these guys. You see it in your life. Yeah, 70 years. Of, yeah, yeah. At least, late 80s, at least. Yeah. Depending on what, it, you know, what his age was when he went in. Uh, yeah, he's in his 80s. Yeah, absolutely. Like Joseph, Daniel understood that he was the Lord's ambassador to the Chaldeans. He was the light of Christ to them. Job knew it. Noah knew it. Joseph knew it. Daniel knew it. We know it. We are ambassadors of Christ to the world in which we live. The influence. It, it, it's not the, splat, the, the flash in the pan. It's that steady guy who just has the same character, the same influence upon people in his life every day. Which is your family, your kin people, maybe the people that you... Like for me, I go to Chick-fil-A every day. Uh, people you deal with, I'm a loyal guy, so once I find somebody that services my car right, I stay with them forever. If I find a grocery store where the people are kind and courteous and all that kind of stuff and have a product I like, I stay with them forever. I mean, I'm, I just have, I was raised to have a sense of loyalty. <clears throat> Doesn't mean everybody has to, I suppose, but that's just the way I was raised. I, I want you to write this verse down in regard to this idea of preserving a nation because this is really important uh, he, uh, to, the, to the subject of Israel, uh, Romans 11, 5, where uh, we talk about a remnant, a remnant. And Joseph, he, he, God used one man to be a preserver of a remnant, and then he uses Daniel the same way for all those in exiles. Uh, and God sent him a great team, Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah stayed in the homeland, but we had Ezekiel and Daniel uh, uh, right up on the front side of this whole, whole thing, and they were, they were dynamite. They were dynamite. Well, the prophecies of Daniel are widely known in both the Old Covenant and New Covenant because he had so much bearing on the second coming of Christ. The righteous life of Daniel is not widely taught among adult age congregation. That was kind of surprising to me. And as a result of that, I may return to the life of Daniel later after I get through what was my assignment. Now, I don't have time tonight because I've ran out of time, but 
point number four is very important for you to look at what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 14, 12 through 20. And when you read it, I want you to pay special attention because he outlines the Leviticus 26, which deals with the five cycles of divine discipline to the priest nation of Israel. And I, I wanted to show you how he goes through it. He doesn't go through it natu in the natural order of them, but he does mention it. And so I laid out this wonderful passage that Ezekiel does um, uh, that's kind of a, a bonus for you. But he's talking about um, the cycles of divine discipline out of Leviticus in Ezekiel 14. And finally, the fifth point for you to look at when you go home is to prepare you for our study as we begin next week. Jesus identifies that. You know what was interesting to me? Theologically, there are a large group of theologians that don't believe that Daniel even existed. And they poo-hoo all of his writings and his prophecy. He was just a great prophetic writer and um, of uh, the first and second coming of Christ and really big on the second coming of Christ. It is Daniel where you get the abomination of desolation. The whole 70 weeks, I mean, the dispensational idea and all that comes out of Daniel. And uh, it's just amazing the attack. And then I got to thinking about it. I mean, this is normal, you know, just probably for other than people like me or a historian, they wouldn't care about studying all this stuff that the people argue about with it. But they just, there's an enormous attack on the person and character of this man, Daniel, in the theology of the church and people like that. And I got to thinking, well, why would they do that? I mean, this is ridiculous. Why would they do that? And it's because of the, listen, it's, it's a satanic attack because he is so strong on the second coming of Christ. His prophecies are still yet to be fulfilled. And, we're, and that's why I'm going to do the 70 weeks. Um, but, um, for example, Jesus identified him both as a person and a, for pro, a prophetic person uh, involved in messianic prophecy. Listen, Daniel, we, we, we always talk about Isaiah because he was a great one. Um, but Ezekiel... The two guys that were big prophets in the, the, the Babylonian captivity are both giants in prophecy of the second coming of Christ. I mean, it is Ezekiel when you want to know about the millennium. If you want to know about the tribulation, go to Daniel. You want to know about the millennium, you go to Ezekiel, don't you? I mean, Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48, boy, he blows it right out of the water. Well, I just find that just kind of interesting. But Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then he says, let the reader, let the reader understand. He, then in Mark 13, 14, talking about the same thing, they add a little bit to it. They say a little, give a little more insight. And when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. We're familiar with that stuff. And so we, next week when we come in, we're going to start our study on the 70 weeks. Now, it takes us a pretty good while to get through all that. I mean, it's only verses 24, 26, 20. You know, but we're going to do a lot of studies off from it because there's a whole lot of stuff there. Okay? A whole lot of stuff. Well, let's have a word of prayer. At release uh, the internet people. We thank the internet people for being with us tonight. And uh, you, you're, you're fortunate to get with us on a new study. So stay with us uh, through the 70 weeks of Daniel. We'll be back next week, Tuesday with you. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have attended with us, both by automobile and by internet. As we enter into a new study uh, on uh, in the book of Daniel, but primarily in the ninth chapter, verses 24 through 27, called Daniel's, Daniel's 70 weeks. And what a marvelous, marvelous, for us, the church age, we set with anticipation of second coming of Christ. And these are prophecies on the tip of our tongue for fulfillment. I mean, hey, Father, we are right here. I mean, this is not, I mean, we're there. 
And so we pray you would give us great insight, give us wisdom, you give us the wisdom that you gave Daniel, Father, to be able to give these prophecies. Give us the wisdom, like Jesus said, let them understand. And I pray, Father, that you would give us that wisdom to understand and see with clarity how this affects what we call eschatology or the second coming of Christ. Um, excuse me, for I've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.